Coleman Alexander Young, the People's Mayor. This is Mayor Coleman Young on the mothership with Mojo, still flying over the city from north to south and from east to west, and still asking the citizens of Detroit to keep the city going strong. This is Mayor Young. Because sometimes you got to get up off your knees and start moving forward. So let's plan the next development for Virginia Park. Let's build some new houses out here. Let's get some dedicated school teachers who live in Detroit. to cooperate with us and giving an education to our children. Now, I can raise as much hell as the next person and talk about how I've been done wrong. But after you get through complaining and listening to your grievances, you begin to realize that nobody is going to help you unless you help yourself. <laughs> now we're talking about these kids who are shooting each other. These kids are not offering. They belong to somebody. And in some cases, they might need some help. There's a whole lot of single parent families out there. In many cases, there's no man in the house. In some cases, no woman, because you know, they run away too. <laughs> so I'm talking about single parent families. After I get through speaking, and Joe, you gave a beautiful speech tonight, but after you get through speaking, I think I have a responsibility to select maybe one kid. One. Give a kid a little money, encourage that kid. Give him some guidance in the school. Help the family. Church groups should do that. Block clubs should do that. We can turn this city around if we recognize that nobody's going to do it but us. Now it seems to me that that's the type of reflection that is demanded from us tonight. That's the type of challenge that we face tonight. I'm glad to be here. I think it's appropriate. But on this day, and you don't see me dressed up like this often, <laughs> I want to apologize. <laughs> but I couldn't get out of it tonight. Because tonight, and I thought it was appropriate that on the 20th anniversary of 57, the transportation system, they said, would never happen the people who were really running downtown. Right, but not only is it running, but we've done something that no other city has done. We put beautiful artwork in every station. Half of those works of art are by the Detroit artists. Detroit artists. That's right. Black and white. Beautiful. That's a sign of what we can do when we put our shoulders to the wheel when we get together. I think that the people move the celebration tonight is the perfect answer to where do we go and are we doing any better. I think the meeting here tonight, the fact that you have taken time out to reflect and to deal with unification and dedication is a guarantee to me that this city can only go forward. This 
city state is in its people. You are its people. You are its strength. Brothers and sisters, let's go from here together. The preceding was his speech uh, to the uh, 20th anniversary uh, banquet at the uh, Joseph Walker Williams Center, commemorating uh, 1967. Polite. I know. You said it Alphonse <laughs> and Gaston. It's worse than that. You said it had a very good day. What did you mean? <laughs> Nothing positive things happened. This morning I thought the receiving of the award from HUD, which is marked the recognition by HUD and uh, people, a committee consisted of mayors and others from around the nation of the, the significance of the accomplishment of the rebuilding of 12th Street when it's mentioned only briefly and in passing in our own press we read all about the burning down but uh, very little about uh, the rebuilding but that's significant and of course uh, the week-long program that the people in this community, who are a remarkable group of people, reflection, unification, was a theme, and a dedication to move forward. As you, as you know, it's an unusual community, and blessed with some real leadership. This meeting seemed more like those gatherings you used to have when you were a state senator over on 14th Street. That's right. That's right. And over uh, at Franklin Settlement, which is where we met uh, once a month. His greatness in life, though silhouetted by meaningless controversy, has finally found its own place in the sun and death. The lion sleeps tonight while on the prowl what a mighty growl, tonight he rests for a little while. From his first until his last breath, every day was a fight, but fought he did with all of his might. The lion sleeps tonight. One day another, inspired by him, will come this way. In his footsteps, he or she too will trod Onward and upward to the top, Mayor Young laid the foundation for us to change the nation. Yes, struggle he did, his pain he hid, and he fought for us non-stop. Though gone from sight, we stand in his light. Now the night is not so dark. Not far away in Elmwood Park, the lion sleeps tonight. Coleman Alexander Young, the people's mayor. You're listening to Electrify Mojo, Rare Moments. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you wish to subscribe, hit the subscription button. If, what was it like on a hot summer night in Paradise Valley? Let's, let let's, Polly tell you that. <laughs> let's, let's go back to uh, a hot summer night in Paradise Valley. Let's talk about what, what was it like. Let's go back to one of the most memorable nights in Paradise Valley. It was live. People were all over the place. There were shows everywhere. Everybody practically in the city had a full show. And everybody had shows. And the people were packed in jams. We had good people. And the girls and guys would come from New York, from California, from wherever. Everybody meet and just made it like one big family. It was no nice that you didn't see a crowd of people. The club was always packed full of people, black and white. And we all had a wonderful time. It was just a gay time there. We had no problems. Being a dancer, what is it like when you go out on stage, you walk out there, you look into their eyes, what kind of feeling is that like for a dancer? But you know, when we walk on the stage, everybody starts to applaud him. That is the utmost of everything. That's your highlight. Because you know you're going to do good now. 
you got a good start. But we don't go out to an artist and they just uh, to, uh, everybody, hey, you know, we're glad to see you. Uh -huh. I think you, you know, you're in Hollywood somewhere. Just dancing on the big stage, Las Vegas. Costumes were gorgeous. The so, girls were gorgeous. So it's not Hollywood, it's Hollywood. Huh? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. Well, you're still gorgeous. Thank you. Um, you talk about 1942 like it was nothing. Uh, there, there are people in this room who uh, were not around in 1942. And, and here you are talking about what you were doing in 1942. Uh, you were gorgeous then, and you're still gorgeous. Still petite. And uh, according to Miss Buck, you can cut a rug anytime you want to. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds good. It's good. I, I love that. Yeah. And thank you guys, too. Oh, wow. Well, I well, wish you could have been around, Mojo. You would have really had yourself a time. You I, saw the whole thing from start to finish. Okay, well, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Uh, I want you to take about two or three minutes, and I'm going to close my eyes, and I'm going to let you start talking. And I want you to take me there through what you remember from Paradise Valley. Oh. Here we go. One, two, three. Well, you can come on. We're going down to the El Sino, and we're going to see the show. And after this show, then I'll take you over to the Turf Bar, because there's a lot of people over there. A lot of people you would like to meet, you would like to get to know, and a lot of famous people also. And then maybe we'll go by and see Miss Buck. And uh, there she and her friends are sitting at the 606 or the Bowling Alley. And we'll just get together and everybody just have one good time and then we all leave and say good night. Is that good? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay, now what famous people are we going to run into? Oh, you're going to run into uh, Miles Davis, Billy Eckstein, uh... Jack, yeah, Dexter Gordon, uh, Jane Ammons, and uh, Wardell Gray, and all of them guys with the band. Then there's S. Erskine Hawkins is coming in here, and there's that crazy red man out of Chicago that uh, wore red the Sanders. red Sanders. You know, you might have heard <laughs> of him. He was wild. He had a big red car, fighting in red, wore a red fireman's hat. And baby, he come down, he's cool. And then everybody see him, here he is. And he thought he was the chief. You know? <laughs> but then, <laughs> Jimmy Lonsky, and all of them. And then I had the pleasure of working with Nat King Cole, too. Tell me about Nat King oh, Cole. he's a gentleman. He's he was unforgettable. Yeah. Uh, tell me about Nat King Cole. Oh, he, we worked with Pudge and I. We worked down the Latin Quarter in Kentucky. And uh, they what, were What did you call him? Nat King Cole. Oh, I thought you said something no, else. No, Pudge and I, that's one of the dancers. Oh, okay. That dance with us right now. Okay. And we were dancing down there. And uh, he was on the show. And Thelma Carpenter, the Delta Rhythm Boys, and uh, all those good guys. Uh, we were just had fun. <laughs> Slappy and White. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that red fox said, wow, man. <laughs> he was with us all the way. And in, in fact, where Fox and I are from, St. Louis, that's my home. Uh-huh. We started in this business together. So we I've been doing pretty good. What was it like working with, uh, let's go back to Nat King Cole. Oh. Uh, what kind of guy was he? He was a wonderful person. Nice, loving kind of person. Always carried a smile. And everybody liked him. The dressing room was filled at all times. He was very polite to everybody. You know, whatever goes on, hey, he don't mind sitting up the girls, but we'll have this, we'll have that, we'll have the other. Very nice man. Couldn't meet a nicer person than that man. When he walked on stage, and I don't know, when you listen to uh, the voice of Nat King Cole, you know, it has a, a timeless magic to it. Uh, it's, I, I would have loved to have been in a club and heard Nat King Cole perform. 
You would have loved it. It was a pleasure every night. Every night. We sit in the wings and wait for him to come on, you know. And here comes Nat. This <laughs> jolly guy. You know, he was a real nice person. And I have a little story I'd like to tell you. Okay, I'd love it. We were at the Broadway Capitol. Medical, Stan Ken, June Christie, and those kids, you know. So I had worked with him previously in Kentucky, so I go down to see the show. So I tell them I'm working the Sport Reason Lounge at this time. So he says, okay, we'll be by to see you. Christy, he came, and Matt and his wife, Stan Ken. So I was just putting on the dog, you know. <laughs> and there's the censors in the house. At that time, we had censors that would come in and censor all the clubs, you know. They would close you up right away, wouldn't they be? <laughs> they close you up, you know. Because the girls would go in topless, and then when they play, when the police is in the house, they'll play strangers in the night. That means don't take off anything. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't take off anymore. <laughs> and I thought I was just a hot to cha cha girl. So the kids come and said, Albert Adams was on the bill with us. And so she says, oh, Nat King Cole's in the house, Nat King Cole. I said, oh, good, good, good. I said, they said they were coming. So I started to dancing, and I was shimmy over here. It was a real, real long bar. Shimmy over here and shimmy over there. I thought I was just great, you know. They thought I was great. So the next morning, I was here lines in the paper. <laughs> I couldn't dance here anymore. Really? I thought I was good, and I was clean. Yeah. But, uh, they just didn't like the way I wiggle my hips. <laughs> and I couldn't work for it indefinitely. Yeah. You know, no more. So when I come back, I come back as a course girl. And Miss Burke brought us out of retirement in 85. And I'm still kicking. <laughs> Miss Polly Garay. Thank you. Uh, one of the dancers from the 360s. Look here, this, this has been uh, uh, an incredible pleasure. Uh, let's talk right now to uh, Jonathan Cartwright from the Paradise Valley. Uh, even though he was a kid back then, uh, tell us, uh, Jonathan, while you were running down the hallways and uh, checking out the general scope of the uh, area, uh, and uh, your uncle was uh, Senator Senator Cod, right? That's right. Uh, what did you see down in Paradise Valley? Uh, oftentimes, my uncle would take me with him, uh, check things out at the hotel, and he would say, "Stay right here," because of some kind <laughs> of, of, the, of the show people and, and show girls. Yeah. And um, you know, being a kid, you know, and he said, "Stay right there," you know. That meant, let's see what he's talking about. And I remember. Cutting through the uh, hallway one day, and uh, one of the chorus ladies would come out, and she was, you know, in her chorus girl stuff, and I felt this presence behind me. It was my uncle's big hand. He turned around. I guess that was the first time that I had an opportunity of seeing a, a chorus, a chorus, uh, a chorus uh, girl. Um, uh, uh, Duke Ellington, uh, Lionel, ha Lionel Hampton. He, uh, he was a nice man. I remember he came up and talked with me, and um, um, I had this, I guess, a Timex watch, and I was explaining to him that this Timex watch could not ever be broken, and he was trying to explain to me that that wasn't true. And <laughs> but he was tender. Della Reese used to work at the coffee place. Della Reese. The That's right. She worked on, down on the switchboard. Della Reese. Uh, the lady that played with Red Fox on... Um, the Red Fox Show. Yeah, right. Uh, what's her name? What's her name? Yeah, what is her name? Yeah. Who plays Alesta role? Uh, the Wanda Page. The Wanda Page. The Wanda Page. Yeah. Uh oh, Wendell scores. <laughs> yeah, Wendell scores. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, everyone was so sharp. Wasn't that right, ladies? I mean, the shoes were were polished, sharp. The stitches in the shoes. I never forget that. The white stitches and the hats and those were days. Those were the days. Um, I can't. I can't. St it's, it's hard to put into words, Mojo. A Saturday night uh, was a a holiday in Detroit. People prepared themselves to go down 
to Paradise Valley and to enjoy themselves. Well, you know, you've got to remember that our mayor came from Paradise Valley also. Yes, Coburn Young was very mm -hmm. much a part of Paradise Valley. Yes, so everything, and we, when you had a melting pot like that, anybody who was anybody was there. You had uh, Adam Clayton Powell, mm -hmm. you had uh, well, Rollo Vest. Rollo Vest's daughter was Sammy Davis's manager when he died, Shirley Vest. Uh, there was just everybody who was anybody that was black. Paradise Valley, as I was told from Mama Betty, Paradise Valley was black all day and about 90% white all night. You're right. You're right. You're right. Paradise Valley. Paradise Valley. Look, it, it has been a most explosive pleasure uh, to uh, talk to each of you tonight and to uh, uh, take us back down memory lane and uh, to uh, Miss Buck and Miss Pollywood Goray. <laughs> what we're gonna do now is take a trip, a trip back into time. Mr. John Watson is our tour master. Back to the past, to the golden days of Paradise Valley. The trip back to Paradise Valley, to Detroit, the way it used to be a long time ago. Hear the joys, the pains, the triumphs, and the sufferings of Detroiters. Tell me, Mr. Watson, uh, what was Paradise Valley? Well, Paradise Valley was an old-time place where it used to be the mecca, whatever, the meta, or whatever it was, was the big-time place for the colored folks in Detroit. This was the camping ground down there. All activity, nightlife, was down in Paradise Valley. <laughs> and the Paradise Valley consisted of the old B&C Club, the turf bar, Dick and the Santa Wine, the lock club, right on between Adam Wine, I mean Santa Wine and Adams, and the old 606 was around the corner of Adams and Santa Wine. Down the street was Club 360 and Paradise Bowl. Lee Luckers round on Grass, the Prosperity Bar. And uh, the Met, I mentioned the Norwood Hotel. That's where the plantation and the chocolate bar was back in those days. Plantation run by Wally Norwood, the chocolate bar, afterwards run by Slim Jones. Well, what made uh, Paradise Valley so special? Well, that's the only place the colored people had to come, man. You know, the show off and whatever. Nightclub, bars and everything right in Paradise Valley. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about some of the uh, old-time players that used to come to Paradise Valley to uh, to play some of the great shows that used to come to Paradise Valley. Yeah, the next day it was located, I mean, at the uh, plantation, uh, Peg Leg Beach, uh, Pete Nugent, he was a tap dancer, and the Cats in the Fiddle, that was a singing group. And Joe Ziggy Johnson, that's where Joe Ziggy Johnson first started down in Paradise Valley. Well, what about people like Charlie Parker, uh, uh, Duke Ellington, uh, Count Basie? Uh, Charlie Parker, years ago, Charlie Parker appeared at the Charlie Pierce, uh, where the old B&C Club used to be. Charlie Pierce came, I'm not, not mean, uh, but the, what's it? Uh, Charlie Parker. Uh, uh, Rod Bird, he came here and brought a whole show, he stayed here for two weeks. At the old uh, Char uh, Charlie Pierce, what was his name, that club? Uh, used to be the B&C, but, but after you got it. Hey, what, what was the name of Pierce Place called the old B&C? El Casino. El, El Casino, yeah. And, uh, were you here? Were, were you here? <laughs> but anyway, yeah, yeah, but anyway, uh, uh, he was at the, as I said, for the John Burke Parker, yeah, he was at the BNC. Tell me, what was a day like uh, uh, in the uh, in Paradise Valley during the Golden Era? 
Paradise Valley when it was looming the place to be. The moment I was the only place for a Negro to be here, unless he walked up and down Hasty Street, you understand? But Paradise Valley, that was, the Negroes had to come down here and show up. That's the only place they had to come. They couldn't go downtown. You went to Fox Day, they had to upstairs. Any place on Woodward Avenue, that was almost taboo. There used to be a restaurant up on uh, what we call the Greenfield. No Negroes alive. Oh, no. Nah. You remember Greenfield? Yeah, 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 this, this, and this was Pika's restaurant, yeah. Bailey Brothers. Yeah. Well, what was the difference between uh, Paradise Valley and uh, Haston Street? Well, Haston Street, Haston Street always had a, a reputation as being Haston Street. Everybody's on Haston Street. Prostitutes, hustlers, gamblers. But Paradise Valley, that was it. Yeah. When you talk about Paradise Valley uh, to people now, especially uh, to the younger generation, uh, a few of them don't exactly know what you're talking about. Uh, how did Paradise Valley get lost? Well, everybody moved out. After Black Bottom, after the old Black Bottom was taken over, everybody moved out around the 7 Mile Road, 8 Mile Road, and all different places, Northwest. And Paradise Valley and Hudson bought up everything down there. Hudson and Strolls. And it just, just disappeared. It was a combination of Hudson, Strolls, and the freeways? And the freeways. Yeah, that, that freeway took Haitian Street, I-75. That took Haitian Street. I ride on that. But then all the rest of Hudson, right in Paradise Valley and Strolls, movie company. Yeah. That was it. Well, uh, people talk about uh, the days when there used to be uh, an unofficial black mayor of Paradise Valley when uh, they used to have the elections and uh, they used to ride around in motorcades. Uh, uh, tell me about that. Well, the first black mayor of uh, Paradise Valley was Royal Lightfoot. Then after Royal Lightfoot came Chester Rennie. That was the mayor of Paradise Valley. So w w what, what was it to be in the mayor of Paradise Valley? Yeah. Uh, what, what was it? What was it like uh, during the daytime in Paradise Valley? People tell me that people w would be walking the streets day and night. I was just uh, that barber shop down there. This was Pika's restaurant. Here down the street was Biddy's restaurant. Over there was uh, the whole the restaurant they called the whole in the whole, whole hotel over there, right on the corner of Adams and uh, uh, Santa Juan, oh, Santa Juan, right. And uh, it was just mostly on the weekends. Thursday, Friday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday was the big days in Paradise Valley. Okay, l let's talk about the hotels. Uh, who stayed at those hotels? Huh? Uh, the hotels in Paradise there was Valley. Only one, there was only one big hotel in Paradise Valley. That was the Norwood Hotel, Walden Norwood's Hotel. That was the biggest hotel for Negroes in the city of Detroit. Outside of Mitchell's Hotel, that to be out on Fort Street. Then after that, the Norwood, I came the Cotton Plaza. No, the, the Gotham Hotel, then the Cotton Plaza. See? That that became the big mecca of uh, the Negro place. See? So, when people like Charlie Parker, Mahalia Jackson, Duke Ellington, uh, Count Basie, when they came to town, is that where they stayed? Oh uh, no, uh, yeah, they used to, they used to stay at the Gotham. I mean, at the Norwood Hotel. But after the Gotham Hotel opened, and all the big bands, and they went to the Paradise Theater up over Woodbury, they stayed. They stopped at the Gotham Hotel and the Carlton Plaza, but mostly at the Gotham Hotel. That was run by Urban Rome. And Rooster Hammond and John Way. Okay, tell me about the Carlton Hotel. What kind of hotel was that like? That was that was a nice hotel, and that was run by that was run by Jews. And Eddie Swan, the head of the NAACP, he was the manager of the Gotham Hotel. Then after the Jews sold the hotel, they sold it to a fellow named Cartwright. He bought it. And he kept it for a while, and then it sold again, and was made into an apartment house in later years. Okay, was that Senator Cartwright? Yeah, 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 yeah. Senator Cartwright. 
Um, okay, well, let, let's talk about the uh, Paradise Theater. Uh, what kind of shows did they have there? Is that currently Orchestra, orchestra Hall now? Oh, no. All jazz show. Duke Elton, Cap Calloway, uh, Lucky Milner, uh, Louis Jordan. I bet you all, all the color shows, that was one of the biggest color shows. I mean, they had the Paradise Valley. No shit. Paradise Theater had the biggest color show. That's what they had. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, had you, have you ever thought about uh, writing a book and uh, chronicling uh, all of your memories? Uh? I, did, I didn't. And I've been in Detroit for 62 years. I came in Detroit in 1929. I'm 77 years old now. Well, I thought you were about 60 years old, so I thought you were going to tell me you were born here. No, I was born, born, born and raised in Philadelphia. And I came here when I was 15 years old. Uh, Mr. Uh, John Watson. Johnny Watson. Poor John. <laughs> That's it. Poor John Watson. Oh, wait, why you call yourself Poor John? That's what pretty good guys used to call me. Well, Freddie Gingard was Joe Lewis' secretary. And always called me poor John. Always tell me I didn't have any money. <laughs> uh, okay, tell me about uh, the days of uh, Joe Lewis. Did Joe Lewis ever come in this? Freddie Gingard. <laughs> office right to John Roxbury's office right on Big San Juan Street. But uh, I went through for me with Joe at first, you know. But Freddie Gingard, that was Freddie Gingard with Joe Lewis, man. Now, Freddie Gingard, he's one to tell you more about Joe Lewis. He got pictures of everything about Joe Lewis. Do, do you have any old pictures of Paradise Valley? No, no, I don't. Now I lost all my stuff moving around, you know. So I don't have any, anything left. Yeah. This is Mojo. I'm in Club 606 in Paradise Valley. And like we said earlier, it's uh, the last uh, remaining club in Paradise Valley and is reportedly the oldest club in Paradise Valley. Uh, let me ask you something. Uh, what do you know about Paradise Valley? I do realize that uh, you were not here during the heyday of Paradise Valley, but you've heard the stories of Paradise Valley. And what have you heard about Paradise Valley that uh, made Paradise Valley so special? Um, basically that it was all black community. There was a vibrant community that blacks had po political power and as well as economical power. And they had a lot of fun. The older people that come through here that we talk to talk about the big bands, the shows they had, and it sounded like fun. A lot different from nowadays, um, where a lot of people go to the suburbs and different things like that. They had their own environment. They had their own community to do their own. And I really I like that. Yeah, Dinah Washington in the background playing right now. Um, when they talk about the heyday of Paradise Valley, do you ever wish that you could take a night train to the past and just walk down oh, the street yeah. to Paradise Valley? Yeah, I do, I do. That's where they talk about how they go to all the clubs and stuff. And uh, Big Ben, Duke Ellington, and Sarah, Nancy. Um, all the entertainers would be there. They're sitting around and you might have like jazz singers, the jazz players, Miles Davis, and all the rest of them were there. Yes, I would like to go back to that time if I could. Okay, and your name? Barbara. Okay, and your name? Tony. Uh, Tony, what do you know? Uh, what have you heard about Paradise Valley? Oh, my mother used to tell me about uh, Paradise Valley in uh, in the terms that it was the only area where blacks could go at the time, and where the big name bands would come: Duke Ellington, Sarah Vaughn, Adela Reese, Diana Washington, and they just have a big party, just going from bar to bar and from restaurant to restaurant. You're here today, um, uh, sitting here, and you are listening to people talk about uh, the golden days. And um, as, you, as you listen to all of this, how it used to be, uh, compared to the way things are now, what do you think we can learn about the past to enhance the present, to design the future? The coming together of black people as a whole, being able to party uh, and enjoy great name entertainment, uh, sitting together, 
no arguing, no fighting, no killing, no drugs, just having a good time. And I would certainly like to take that night train back to the past, back to Paradise Valley. I would have loved to have been a part of this. They must have had a great time. In fact, I know they had a great time. I used to work at the 606. And the old timers that would come in, that's all you would hear as the stories about Paradise Valley. That, that must have been a fantastic experience. But what are some of the stories they used to tell? About how they would go from club to club and from restaurant to restaurant. Uh, apparently, black people had, uh, uh, I wouldn't say a lot of money, but money for that time. Apparently they lived well, the people that came to Paradise Valley. You know, they were, uh, there was a togetherness. And apparently they were able to, you know, they had the, the, the uh, election of their mayors. Horseshoe. Right, you walk down to the horseshoe, it was the three sixes in the horseshoe, and um, you had the Biltmore Hotel, you had the El Sino, you had the Pelican Restaurant, the Peking Restaurant set here, you had Gold's Drug Store, and we had um, the Rainbow Bar, you had the Turf Bar which sat right next door, in fact, and that was a popular night spot. And then you had uh, you had the Barber College down here. Like, it was their own community. And as kids, they used to, they had their own mayor, and as kids used to sit out to watch the entertainers come in and go out because they were always dressed. Oh, can I get your name again? My name's Eleanor Monroe. Eleanor Monroe, uh, sharing a few memories about Paradise Valley, memories that she obviously... Uh, uh, shared with, shared with the other people okay. down through the years, but you definitely uh, have your history intact. You were telling me uh, historically and geographically where everything was located in the Paradise Valley. Uh, tell me, um, the Paradise Valley that you've heard about, um, how, did, how did we let it uh, slip away, those the glory days? I think how the glory days really slipped away was most of them making their demise, such as our dear friend Mabel, and we're not being a strong enough community within ourselves to keep it together. But Michael, being a strong person, managed to keep one lasting place, one memorable place in the valley open. And so many people still frequent here. They come from out of town to still come to the Horseshoe because it's still in the valley. And hopefully, we might be able to Revise the valley. Paradise Valley. Um, tell me, uh, what, do, what do you know about Paradise Valley and what makes Paradise Valley so special? I came to, uh, uh, your name? Troy, my name is Charlene Joyner. I came to Troy in 1944 and this was set up. They had 606 for kids, they uh, three six dancers, and they perform every nine then. They used to do it at the last quarter. And uh, they had they have a bar. I mean, bar, I mean, uh, barber down, barber shop down here. It's just across the street there. And uh, they tore down everything that they had except this. Thelma Young threw this from uh, the Horseshoe Lounge from down there, where it was to here. And um, they had their own hotel. They had everything. You know what they call black business. Made it, which is. The, I think they had a bar called the Paradise Bar, so they call it the Paradise Valley. Do you did you ever come down to Paradise Valley? Huh? Did you ever come to Paradise Valley? Yes, I did all the time. Uh, uh, who were some of the uh, uh, entertainers that you uh, got a chance to see down here? I heard of that were down here. Lil Green, uh, Nat King Cole, um, Lionel Hampton. Uh, oh, when they had the Paradise Lounge. I mean, Paradise Theater, all entertainers, Duke Gallatin, all entertainers that entertained that they would come down to eat and be around the, the neighborhood because it was called, the, you know, the black part of the city. Uh, what was it like sitting down for a Nat King Cole concert? Uh, Nat King Cole was at the Paradise uh, Theater. It was very good, very good. He had the uh, Nat King Cole trio. And they played, and they always had another act with them. And it was very good. 
Well, thank you very much for sharing your memories on Paradise Valley. Well, you know, I was saving, uh, I was saving a spot for you on this tape. Uh, you disappeared for a minute there, but I said we're gonna come back and find you. Uh, we're here at the club 606 Horseshoe Club, and what's your name? Clinton Quincy Jackson. Uh, you, um, when they talk about Paradise Valley, when people talk about Paradise Valley, they talk about number one. They talk about uh, elegantly uh, dressed people, and uh, they talk about uh, how the guys would come out with their shoes uh, spit shined. You could see yourself in them, uh, fur-lined coats, and flowers on their lapel, um, pinstripe ties, uh, derbies. But right now you have uh, a mink-lined coat, uh, you have a flower on your lapel, yellow pinstripe tie on, and your shoes are spit shine, and you have your derby on. Uh, tell me, uh, during the uh, glory days of Paradise Valley, uh, is this what you would always see? Yes, I mean, down through the years, I mean, it, uh, a lot of us fellows at the, the time when Hastings Street was Hastings Street, this was uh, actually uh, our playground, especially in the work to the weekends. And this was the meeting place that everyone would know that they could catch up with their friends over the weekend. And actually, the Paradise Valley was the backbone of the entertainment for the black population here in the city of Detroit. Just as sharp as you were probably the first day that you came in here. Uh, when you walk in here, what are some of the memories that flash? Well, so many things that come back to my attention were that uh, it was a predecessor that was set in the black community that the uh, your appearance was one of the things that uplifted you and also it was an inspiration to the younger black people that was such as your all strains coming along and um, it was like an, uh, an art was handed down by our parents as far as uh, dressing, what to dress, what to wear, and how to dress. And uh, it, it only meant that when the person was out, it, it enabled them to carry themselves in the upright manner. And uh, it was an inspiration to the black people here in the city of Detroit, Paradise Valley. And uh, like it is of today, uh, it enables a person to reminisce. And um, we know for an actual fact that Detroit is on its way back because, I mean, that uh, we're still carrying on that same tradition. A nice place for people to come and gather and have a nice time. What, what could young people today uh, learn from uh, your experiences of Paradise Valley? Well, I would say that uh, I've noticed here of the clubs that's reopening here later, the new ones that's taking place, is opening up, that they are featuring signs telling the people that you must be properly dressed. And uh, it's just a matter that, well, if you look nice, in general, most likely, when you're out, you'll care, you'll act nice, and also you'll be mannerable, especially towards our lady folks, because the black woman is deserving of that. And uh, we want all the young people to know that uh, even though they're saying that Detroit is uh, given a uh, bad name as being rough and all of that, that this isn't true. And that really, that the other side of it is that we uh, endeavor to bring back the same uh, means of socializing, fraternizing, with one another. You mentioned uh, respect for um, ladies, uh, respect for yourself. Uh, if you uh, dress good, you feel good, you act good, you think good thoughts. Uh, tell me, if, um, if we could take uh, the entire radio audience now uh, back uh, down memory lane uh, to the the most uh, precious memory you have here on Paradise Valley, uh, what would they see? Uh, well, the message that I'd like to give that 
At one time, not only in the city of Detroit, that's throughout the whole United States, your large metropolitan cities, that uh, we were being discriminated against certain Caucasian bars. Uh, they uh, more or less didn't care whether they had the black trade or not. And so as we uh, went about our business and, 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 and set a pedestals uh, towards the other uh, well, uh, I would put it this way: as far as, as far as the other ethnic groups, groups was concerned, <coughs> concerned, they paid attention to that, and so we looked up and found that they, in a lot of cases, didn't want us to come to their places, but they started coming down to the Paradise Valley because <coughs> uh, we attracted their attention. You know that we know how to take and carry ourselves in a manner, respectful way that we would be accepted by uh, the other ethnic, ethnic groups throughout the city of Detroit. And um, uh, today I'm in hopes that I heard tell that Mary Young, Judge Alex Allen, uh, the head judge around the 39th District Court, that they say they will stop by the Horseshoe Bar if they get a chance. Uh, to more or less let people know that they still remember the nice times that black people used to have when socializing, fraternizing one another down in Paradise Valley. Well, thank you very much for your comments. How you doing? We talked to you on the... Uh, I'll set this off. Okay, you can just... Stop. Paradise Valley. I met, came in Paradise Valley in 1977 from jury duty looking for a place to eat. And when I came in here, it seemed like it was Black Cheers, and I've been in here ever since. Well, look, um, um, since you've been coming down to Paradise Valley, what are some of the stories you've heard about the glory days of Paradise Valley? Well, there's a lot of good ones that I can't talk about on program. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to force you to do that. Your name? Gus. Okay, thank you very much, Gus. All right. We're here at Club 606, and uh, we've talked to some very illustrious people about their memories of Paradise Valley, and um, uh, people that are gathered here right now I have definitely uh, come to reminisce and to go back down memory lane and to relive the stories and the glory days of Paradise Valley. Uh, what's your name? My name is Sandra. Uh, like I said, uh, I worked here for the last 15 years and met the old timers and heard their stories and the way they reminisced and uh, it's like secondhand stories, you know. I, I know for one thing. They had some good times in Paradise Valley, and there were a lot of very interesting people that came through, and uh, a lot of names, and uh, Pearl Bailey, and uh, Dinah Washington, and uh, Billie Holiday, uh, a lot of famous dancers and people that, you know, helped make the memories of Paradise Valley. Well, uh, having, you know, worked here behind the bar for 15 years, uh, tell me, uh, what, is, what is the greatest story you've heard about uh, Paradise Valley? The greatest story I've heard... The greatest story I heard was about Mabel Walker. Mabel Walker, she started working here when she was like uh, about 16 years old. I think she was almost really too young to start working in a bar and uh, she worked here for uh, up until like the last five months of her life. That's the greatest story I've heard and I think that she should get some type of recognition for it. She was a great person, she was uh, loving, she cared for everyone, she, uh, she knew how to um, communicate with everybody. She had a nice word for everybody. Everyone that came in here loved Mabel and she left some type of impression on all of us and I loved her dearly. Um, Mabel Walker is 
uh, one of the, or is she, she is the last uh, uh, bartender is from the golden era of Paradise Valley, is that true? That's right, that's right, there will never be another one. She was like, she is the oldest barmaid ever to work in this, black barmaid to ever work in the city of Detroit. And I don't think that anybody will ever be able to come behind her and uh, do anything that, like I said, she was, she's just one of a kind. There'll never be another Mabel Walker. What are some of the stories you heard about Billie Holiday when she performed in Paradise Valley? Um, didn't he I didn't hear a lot of stories about Billie Holiday. I just heard that she performed at, you know, the different clubs, the Three Sixes, uh, the, um, I can't even think of the other places, but I, I know that she did perform in Paradise Valley. Uh, well, thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you. This is Electrifying Mojo. We're still here live at Club 606, and here's Mr. Jimmy Wilson. When you walked in, a few people in the back said, uh, said, there's Jimmy Wilson, go get Jimmy Wilson. He can tell you some great stories about Paradise Valley. What can you tell me about Paradise Valley? I can tell you about the, uh, the valley and through. I was a very close friend of Mabel's, and I think Mabel was a mascot. She was a companion. She was loved and loved the valley. Uh, she's been used to dance a, a little. She has known, I imagine, everyone in the valley when it was in its heydays. And I would say that she always said, all right now, all right now. And I definitely believe Mabel is all right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. You, you, you had referred to her as the mother of Paradise Valley. Yes. Uh, tell me, uh, some of your memories of Paradise Valley, some of the great entertainers that used to come through here. Tell me, what was life like a... Uh, what was it like a day in the life of Paradise Valley? Well, you know, during that time we had the blind pigs, we had numbers down here, and I would say the poor black man, it was one of the chances of him to get something. And in the valley we had all we had Sport Breeze, the El Cena. It was a place where people came and just enjoyed and made took nothing and made something out of it. Being just being entertainers, just being themselves. It's just a beautiful memory down here. And there's so many the who's been down here. Here's Scotty which was Mabel's boyfriend, the gentleman right here. And that's Scotty, he, he's been down here a long time. It's, it's just a flowing evolution of time which brings it all down of saying, we have a place still to come. And I believe the Paradise Valley will come again. Maybe not in the same form, but it will come again. All things do. Uh, when, when they talk about Paradise Valley, uh, you know, they talk about like the Mecca, the, the golden age uh, uh, for the uh, black community in the uh, city of Detroit. Um, what can, uh, w what are some of the positive things about Paradise Valley that could change things around for Detroit today? If they could go back to Paradise Valley, what could they learn that could help them uh, uh, correct uh, some of the things in the city today? Well, down here, you know, we had a receiving hospital. And through receiving hospital, this is where most of the poor people, I'm emphasizing on poor people because that's what we were, they would come and get services, they were sick. Uh, this instituted uh, the black people to take their children in so they could come nurses and doctors and work in the capacity of the courts. And this was ele elevating us. And in a positive way, I think we have really come a long ways of, of of reaching some of our goals and I think we have more to go uh, I think out of our entertainers uh, relating all the way back to uh, I'll say Sarah Vons and Ella Fitzgerald all of them came to the 606 this was what you call the Paradise Valley uh, Ethel Waters I had a chance to eat in the 606 with Ethel Waters one time a beautiful person these people they have given so much and instill so much into our younger generation. This is why you get some of your great singers. Uh, Kim Weston, Donna Ross, uh, so many of our entertainers came directly from right down here in the valley. 
Mr. Jimmy Wilson. Thank you very much. And thank you. All right. Okay. Whatever it takes. Thank you. All right. So she knows nothing. <laughs> I just wanted, what she knows, I don't, you don't want to know. Come here, baby. Come here, save yourself. Yeah, you can't use that on no tape. <laughs> Because I was going to the state, so I was my birthday This is Electrify Mojo at 606. And uh, your name? John Mitchell. Uh, John, what can you tell me about the glory days of Paradise Valley? The stories you've heard. I know you were too young to be a part of Paradise Valley, but uh, you look like you could tell me quite a bit. Well, I uh, only thing I knew, I should start coming down here. At the 606, like uh, when I jury duty had come in, and I started meeting all these lovely people, and I've been coming back ever since. What, what are some of the stories they've told you? Oh, they used to tell me about the good times they used to have, the old timers, Bill Eckstein, and everybody used to be down in the valley. And uh, it's a lovely crowd. You know, you got a lovely crowd down there. There's no riffraff. It's, it's really nice. Jack Evans. Uh, a, a little bit of the history about what I know about the, the valley is from years back when the bar used to be located on Adams and St. Antoine on the corner. The, the thing that used to even impress me about this place at the time was that it was made somewhat on the order of a cowboy saloon. They had a bar that was in the shape of a horseshoe. And I believe that it used to seat 60 some people. But the, the things that I used to like about the valley was that the people were always friendly. You could come and go as you please. Uh, they were always just, well, there were a lot of entertainers who used to come through the valley. <laughs> Lionel Hampton, uh, Count Basie, uh, Sarah Bond, Diana Washington. There were numerous of entertainers who came into the valley. Uh, see, the people, like I said, the people were always just friendly and, and just open up their, their hearts to you down here in the valley. Uh, what, what could uh, the valley people uh, tell Detroit uh, today about unity, about sticking together, about being each other's best friend? Yeah, the people of the valley could really put the message out today to, to tell people as far as unity, being able to trust one another and being able to see about your fellow man, care about him, uh, to just really just have some love and care within oneself about others. Uh, to get themselves away from the drug scene, to be able to communicate with people more, uh, to really just
being able to just open your heart and just really care about people instead of just wanting to go your own way and not caring. Okay. What are some of the things you remember about Paradise Valley that made it such a special place to be? The nightclubs, the bright lights, big city, remind you of um, Las Vegas, New York, uh, Club El Sino, the Turf Bar. I was young, but my father used to drag me down in this area because he was always up and down the streets, uh, Paradise Valley streets, and this is why I'm familiar with it. And I was shocked. I came down here about a year ago on jury duty, and that's how I happened to come about the club. And I was surprised to find out that the 606 was still here. I thought there were no clubs down here any longer. But at that time, I found that the club was still here, the food was still good, the people were still very friendly in everything. And I'm not a spring chicken myself. I'm up at age. I won't say how old, but I, I remember, I recall as a young girl that it was beautiful. I mean, I just, you love to come down. It was so much enthusiasm. Um, I remember my mother, my father, different ones, used to, used to look forward to the weekends, whereas they could dress up in their finery and come out and party in Paradise Valley. It was one of the few places that black people could come and dress up and really enjoy themselves because this is where all black people got together and enjoyed one another. In fact, I think at that time we didn't have many places to go, so this is where everybody met up, was down in Paradise Valley. Do you think people were closer together then? Yes, I do. I believe everybody was much closer, you had much better relationship, and everybody looked out for each other back in that time. But now that we have spread so far apart, I just don't think the closeness is there any longer. I've heard that uh, so many times uh, that everybody looked out for everybody else. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, well, people looked out for, if, if they knew you, knew you, they knew your kids, they looked out for your kids. If someone needed something, you didn't have any money, you didn't have any food, any clothes, they made it their business to see that you got food, uh, money, and clothes. It wasn't a me, myself, and I, whereas you only looked out for yourself as so many do today. During that time, if my brother had some money, you had some money. It's like that record, Jeffrey Osborne, my brother's in trouble, so am I. Would, yeah. would that uh, epitomize Paradise Valley? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Charles Lusby. I have been coming down to Paradise Valley uh, since 1975 when I first started practicing law here. The remembrances of Paradise Valley that I recall vividly, not firsthand, uh, are things like between Madison and Beacon, uh, it's my understanding that the late uh, Father Divine had a missionary uh, during hard times such as we're having today where persons could come in and for I think as little as a dime or 15 cents get a full course meal. There were, during uh, Prohibition, uh, many uh, uh, places in this immediate area between uh, Madison and uh, Beacon uh, you could entertain yourself uh, by uh, games of chance uh, <laughs> uh, primarily blackjack I understand and, and dice uh, those are the remembrances that uh, I have been told about since I've been here uh, coming here uh, many of the people uh, are much older uh, have come and gone, such as um, uh, Mabel Walker, who passed very recently. But um, it's just an interesting place to be. Um, it's, it's, it's chock full of uh, black history. The thing that, that concerns me is how the expressway, I-75, came down uh, Hastings and destroyed the black business uh, area in the city. Uh, the, the, the um, for instance, Mabel was the oldest black barmaid in the city. I think she started working here at the 606 in 1936, the year I was born. Uh, but with the advent of the expressways coming through the black business district here in Detroit, uh, all of the businesses, the uh, on Hastings, uh, the Paradise Bowl, the Paradise Bowling Alley, uh, 
just went. Uh, now that was not on Hastings, but it was in Paradise Valley. These are the kind of things that are unfortunate when we think about the destruction of uh, employment base uh, and the demise of black businesses. When we reflect back, we see that Detroit had a thriving black business, uh, small business, uh, particularly at one time. Do you, what, what, what impact do you think, uh, say, the uh, destruction of that base? Uh, because when people uh, talk about Paradise Valley, um, uh, areas like uh, Harlem and, you know, another great uh, uh, ethnic uh, business districts uh, in other cities across the country come to mind. Uh, how much has uh, Detroit missed uh, with the loss of, say, Hastings Street, Paradise Valley? Uh, much of it brought up by uh, Stroh's, uh, Hudson's, well, Warehouse District. Um, what has the destruction of all of that done uh, to the city as a whole, would you say? To me, what it has done, and I think this might be a subtle uh, thing, uh, back then we had a, 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 an entrepreneurial, uh, there were black folk who were entrepreneurs in business sense. The state, uh, one of the businesses that uh, was very thriving, the number business, the, the state of Michigan took that over. You know, that was probably the most thriving uh, uh, business, per se, uh, uh, in Black Bottom. Uh, the, the state took that over much much later, but before that, the state destroyed the uh, the smaller businesses, and it it removed the uh, the business class. And I think what that did was to ultimately destroy role models in a sense. The idea that a person could start small and and build a business and have something. Uh, many of our young folk, I think have never heard the name Barkwell Drugs, for instance. And that, that uh, name carried on at least 15 uh, drugstores throughout the uh, metropolitan area. Uh, in fact, I, until I started talking, I'd forgotten about Barkwell Drugs. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we're not all geared or have always been working for other people. We have not always had to go entirely to other folk for employment. There were blacks hiring blacks uh, in the city of Detroit. Uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, we hired enough blacks to be self-sufficient, but I'm saying that we had businesses where that was passed on from generation to generation, such as the 606. This is the third generation of this bar here. Uh, I think it, it, it stood as a role model. And we, we lost that. And um, of course, overall, I think uh, many of us are much better off presently than we were uh, 40 years ago. But many of us are worse off. And I don't want to take up all the time, but it seems to me that if you are a middle class um, um, non white person, you're probably better off. The middle class has increased. However, the bulk of us in the city of Detroit are doing worse today than we were uh, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, you could employ, you could get a job at Ford, Chrysler, and support a family with little or no formal education. That day has gone. You are lucky to get a job with a bachelor's degree <laughs> today. And then it's the question whether or not you can support a family uh, on the uh, on your income. But those are things I think that transcend the black community. They exist for all of us uh, due to the economy primarily. But basically, the the highways, the expressways, and the state itself had as much to do with the destruction of black business in this city, in my opinion as anything else. And I wonder sometimes if it was a mere accident. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your comments. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Hey, that, that was a very eloquent piece.
the because uh, you know what what I what I, uh, what I want to do uh, originally is uh, continue. This is Horace Gunn from the Paradise Valley. I've been down here about 45 years. Me and neighbor, we are just good friends. Uh, it have been nice things have been to him. We are all in together, so I'm going to make a show. I'm going to make a show. So uh, what are some of the great... Uh, Great entertainment that you remember from Paradise Valley. Tom Basie, for one, I shake his hand. Tom Basie. When Tom Basie came to town, you were there with your lady. At the church bar. No, at the church bar. Yeah. Tom Basie. Well, uh, think back to the most exciting moment that you spent in Paradise Valley. Well, this time was. Fifty-six. Uh, nice time. Nice time. But what'd you do? Well, I danced. Then I was drinking pretty heavy. Had fun. So that's enough. I mean, I ain't the devil right now. Hey, hey. Well, we can use some of it. I do thank you for talking to us. All right. Hi, I'm Cindy Tinsley, Cindy's Flower Shop. Ex-neighbor of Mabel Walker for years on Winder Street. Between John Albert and Brush, I lived three doors from her. We were very good friends and I loved her. We knew Paradise Valley. We loved Paradise Valley. And I remember the good old days. When it was uh, safe to walk the streets and wander around the club sedan and the 606 lounge. And uh, it's just not the same anymore, but the memories are still there. Let's talk about some of those great memories. Uh, when you think about the uh, nights on Paradise, uh, in Paradise Valley, uh, what night stands out as being a night that represented one of the best times that you could remember here? Oh, weekends after work, we would wander around the valley and go from place to place. And there were a lot of places to go to around here then on Adams and St. Ed Wine and whatever. And uh, we enjoyed it, and it was safe to walk the street. Uh, somebody told me that uh, you often got uh, mistaken for Billie Holiday. Did you ever see her live on stage? Never live on stage, but I saw lots of pictures of her. I got one hanging in my bedroom now. And several people have told me that I resemble her very much when I was young and pretty. <laughs> well, you're still pretty. And you're still young. <laughs> <laughs> the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, there was a place called Paradise Valley. It was a mecca for entertainment, not just for Detroiters, but throughout the world. People came to Paradise Valley and found that it was bordered on the south side by Gratiot, on the north side by Verna Highway, on the east side by I-75, and on the west side by Brush. And that was Paradise Valley. Now, something else struck me because I, I had always driven through that air, area and uh, I'd seen uh, some of the old houses down there and I've always been particularly amazed at the architectural structure of uh, that particular region, not knowing its historical significance. And the more I found out about Paradise Valley, the more I wanted to find out about it. The telephone calls that I've gotten about Paradise Valley have been most astonishing. The phone lines have been lit up every night. People telling me about their connections with Paradise Valley. As a matter of fact, last night I got a telephone call from uh, a lady by the name of... Um, her first name was Adela. She told me that she used to be a, a waitress at, a, I think it was Pickens Restaurant. She told me that after all of the big shows in Paradise Valley, people like Count Basie, 
uh, Duke Ellington, uh, Sarah Vaughn. After the big shows, they all used to come to the restaurant and eat. She told me that she had been listening to uh, the story on Paradise Valley, and um, she used to be a waitress there, and she used to personally take care of uh, people like uh, Louis Satchimo Armstrong, and uh, got a call from uh, so many people, from an old man, and... Um, he told me that, uh, I asked him how did he find out about the tribute to Paradise Valley, and he told me, well, I listen to you every night, and he said, uh, 35, 35, 35, and then he said, 75, 75, 75, and I said, wow, that just gives you some idea of the type of people that, uh, do remember Paradise Valley and do cherish it as a very historical section of the Motor City and the world because of the uh, entertainment culture that uh, it attracted to the city. Tonight, my special guest is Miss Beatrice Buck, also Miss Polly Goray, uh, who uh, was one of the featured dancers. She was a chorus girl and she got to be Super 8. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Polly. They tell me that Polly was, in fact, there was a lady called Betty Taylor who was the producer of the shows there. Even among we darling blacks, they would hire the high yellow. And Polly was the darkest one, but Polly was the dancingest one that you ever did see. And they say that uh, Polly, they had her in the back row until this lady who had the club says, what about the little black one? Bring her up front, bring her up front. And they eventually made her the soubre, which is what they call, which was like the lead dancer. Isn't that what you, you yeah. it was the uh, lead uh, uh, dancer? And she's just fantastic and is still dancing and can dance. Well, that, that's, that's incredible. Look, let, let's talk to you just for a second, Polly. To, uh, and maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the, uh, the era of uh, Paradise Valley, the golden days of Paradise Valley. Um, uh, how, did you, how did you get to Detroit and how did you get, how did you get dancing and uh, how, did you, uh, how did you get so famous as a dancer? Because uh, after I talked to people down at uh, the 606 Horseshoe Lounge, uh, they were telling me about the dancers and and uh, they were talking about you. They were they were speaking uh, from their memory. And, and, and how did you become so etched in the minds of uh, the people who uh, went to those shows? Well, you know, I came here with a road show called Royal American Shows. And Leon Claxton had the girls on the show at that time coming out of Tampa, Florida. And they would come into Dearborn, and every night we guys would come out to see the show. We'd come back in town with them. So I got a job dancing, tap dancing with a boy called George Mungo. And we worked at the B&C at that time, and that was in 42. And it was earlier than 42. It was about 40. And I started dancing with him. And uh, so Betty Taylor, she was at the Three Sixes. And she saw me dance, and she asked me to come over and join the group. And I stepped over there, <laughs> and been going ever since. Well, that was in 42? Yeah. Well, how do you stay so pretty? Oh, I got a secret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell me, um, let's talk about some of the great shows uh, that... Uh, you were a part of in Paradise Valley? Well, I was a part of the Three Sixes, the El Sino, Sporteries Lounge. Then I worked at the Burlesque Theater. I was with our course line there. Betty Taylor's had us down there. So from that on, we just did everything in Detroit and started going to different places. And I was fortunate enough to work with people like Diana Washington, and Nito Day, and they were all at the Flame Show Bar, and I was there with Ziggy Johnson at the time. What was it like working with uh, Diana Washington? What kind of lady was she? She was cool. She was a nice person, but she was Diana, you know. She stood on her two feet. 
<laughs> whatever you she had to say, she would say it. She was a wonderful person, don't you think so, Miss Beth? You know I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well tell me, um, what was it like, uh, what was a typical night like uh, uh, at a club in the 30s and the 40s uh, with the course girls coming out? Did they have the course girls come out, then the featured entertainers came uh, Come out! You came out and just basically yes. got everybody in the mood for the show. Yes. Now we were the chorus girls, and it'd be from six to eight of us. And uh, when I got here to Detroit, I started working at the Three Sixes, and it was eight girls. And we worked from there over to the Plantation, which is used to be the Old Norwood Hotel, and uh, Maybell, Frankie, Della, Maddie, and myself. We all work together there. Well, I understand that uh, uh, upon demand that you, you still perform. Yes, we perform for Miss Buck. We did seven shows with her, and we did the play Paradise Valley. We did that with her, and about a couple of months ago, she took us to the castle. And those five little women, the girls, the young girls, asked them, what are y'all trying to do, kill us? Those little ladies, uh, who is obviously past 50, those little ladies outdanced everybody on that stage. One day, uh, well, I got a film on it, but the We Remember Idlewild show had just a stage full of dancers. And if you could have seen these little ladies go, boy, it, 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 it's it's it's. It's electrifying. It's like the electrifying mojo. It's electrifying. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> Idlewild was the first black entertainment strip. It was the first black summer resort. The people from Detroit, a lot of them even bought homes in Idlewild. So you have the shows there. Now, Idlewild's big shows came later. Uh, did you dance in Idlewild, Polly? Yeah. Uh, Ziggy Johnson was the producer of most of the shows in Idlewild for Martha Braggs. And that's where the Four Tops got their start. That's where Della Reese got her start. That is why, where, oh, there's a bunch of uh, Detroiters that started uh, in Idlewild, actually, and came back really? to Detroit. They would bring the Idlewild review, review back to Detroit in the wintertime, and I know that they would play the Flame Show Bar. This is a little after the Paradise Valley. My name is Everett Watson Schultz, and uh, as a, I was a child in the valley, and my grandfather had a business down here, he was, uh, one of the earlier black entrepreneurs in the city of Detroit, he had a bowling alley around the corner, Paradise Bowl, Watson Realty, and uh, was, he had this whole street was just full of it, and he had a, the, uh, Alcino, you had uh, Biddy, you had Fish Dock, you had Chinese Food Restaurants, you had a whole community, three, four restaurants, you had a doctor down here on the corner. You had uh, Haston Street over there that was a thriving black uh, business district. And uh, right straight through here, you had people who lived, you had black people who lived in the community who were able to support themselves through their own efforts, and uh, black people who utilized the services that was there for the, for the community by other black businessmen. And there's been no black community, a solid black uh, business community in the city of Detroit since then. When big fighters would come into town, I remember as a ch child standing on the corner of Beacon and say that wine with a flatbed truck with a, with a boxing ring on the back. And they would drive through the, the valley and they stop on a corner, a couple fighters to advertise a fight or whatever was happening in those days that have them at uh, Olympia, it was a place called Olympia. They'd have a fighter on the truck. And as a child standing on the corner, 
watch them fight around and then they drive a truck two or three blocks and then they fight another round and they stop and drive the truck. I, I run all over Paradise Valley, all up and down the street, following this truck around, watching these fights round by round. That's how they used to would advertise big name fights. They have some local pugs on the back of a truck with a boxing ring. They fight on a corner and round and bing, and then they take off and fight a couple rounds somewhere else. That was the kind of exciting things I remember in Paradise Valley. It was, a, it was a very thriving community. And people came from all over the country to come to Detroit. To, you had a hotel, you had the Flame Show Bar, Gotham Hotels, and all up down through uh, John R. and uh, St. Antoine and Hastings Street. People came from all over the country just to come and visit this area for the, the clubbing and the parties. Then you had, like I said, thriving economy here. Now you got a city with, uh, you got black people. It's, it, you, you had a small period with a lot of black people in it, but it really wasn't a ghetto. Because you had people that were living, they were enjoying themselves, but they didn't feel like they was hemmed up in there. And they could support themselves, and they loved that little section. Now you got black people all over the city, and it seems like a big ghetto. Because you got no businesses, you don't own anything. You're on your own. You got to go out to suburbs. You got to go to the white community to get everything. So uh, it's, it, it seems more like a ghetto in the city of Detroit now than it did then. That's what I remember about sitting at mine in Paradise Valley area in the city of Detroit. Tell me, um, in the entertainment life, uh, big name people that used to come down uh, to the valley, that used to come to. Uh, Detroit just to play the Valley. Uh, what big names do you remember? Do you recall uh, going to any particular concerts uh, back during the glory days of the Valley? I don't remember much as concerts. Like I said, I was a youngster and a, and a teenager. Uh, I remember seeing Sarah Vaughn at the Flame Show Bar. Uh, she'd be in town quite often. Uh, right across Caddy Corner, across the street from where we're sitting right now, it used to be the Alcino. You had people there, you had the Illinois Jacket. Uh, names like that would come into town. As a child, my mother and folks would take me up to uh, the Paradise Theater, and you'd have all the big names that come through there, big bands would come through there, you know. And you go, you get, you see a movie and a, and a stage show. And I mean, that was damn good day. You go see a movie, see a top night movie and a cartoon and everything, and then you see a stage show. And uh, Detroit was just that kind of town. Everybody all over the country knew what Detroit was in company. It was a big old country town. We could have good, clean, fun, and had everything there like any other city. But it wasn't uh, a very friendly community in those days. Very friendly community. But like I say, I remember uh, that mostly people come to town as a teenager, I'd be standing outside, you know, trying to catch a glimpse of them or stand outside the door and listen to the music come out through the bar door, something like that. And like I said, a few times, you know, as a child, you go to Paradise Theater, you see, but the names I can remember, like, naturally, all of Basie, Earl Garner, come through town, stayed in town, Earl Garner, see, like, he stayed in town for a while. Illinois Jack Cat was in town all the time. Uh, Sarah Vaughn, naturally Donna Washington stayed in Detroit. Uh, in them days, there wasn't nobody that was big that wasn't coming through Detroit. All, anyone you want to name would come through Detroit and would enjoy being here. It was that just kind of town, entertainers. It was almost a town where entertainers were after New York. I think they come to Detroit. You know, even though Chicago was there, the New York crowd had its crowd, but Detroit had its own little click too, you know, its own uh, uh, lifestyle. I'd say that would be more like lifestyle. It was different than lifestyle in Chicago. It was different than lifestyle in New York. It was Detroit lifestyle. So look at thank you very much for talking to us. You're listening to Electrifying Mojo, Rare Moments. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you wish to subscribe, hit the subscription button. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you wish to subscribe, hit the subscription button. If you wish to subscribe, hit the subscription button. Hit the subscribe.